Afternoon, everybody. We're just um, preparing for our webinar. Uh, people are coming in the in the uh, session at the moment, so we'll just give them a minute or two to come through the waiting room door. And uh, when that starts to slow down, we'll go. Hopefully, everybody can see our speakers. We have a small problem at the moment because Daniel hasn't. Um, hasn't arrived yet, uh, but hopefully he'll turn up before he has to speak. And um, we'll go from there. So we're in the uh, the webinar today will be in uh, in the sort of webinar presenter mode, which means that uh, people from the public will be able to put things in the chat and put questions in the q and I have a list of questions here as well that people have already sent in. Uh, we'll do those at the relevant time. Um, so before we start, Farmers for Climate Action would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we work. In my particular case, it's Wiradjuri land in southern New South Wales. And we'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of our guests and speakers are joining us from and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Um, now, we'd like to thank everybody for attending today. I'm not sure, I don't have a list of, of any particularly special people that have attended. So well, I apologize for that, but anyway, thanks for everybody else that's turned up. Um, now, your first speaker today will be Joris Eakins, Eakins. Uh, now he is, if I can get the right page, Joris serves as Managing Director of Squirrel Energy, which develops, builds and operates battery storage systems across Australia. He boasts an impressive career in renewable energy, encompassing expertise in engineering, procurement, construction and management consulting. He possesses a profound understanding of the intricacies involved in project development and delivery. Having actively contributed to numerous renewable energy initiatives, Joris has played a pivotal role in the success of solar farms exceeding 850 megawatts. So I shall hand over to you, Joris. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone and, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, present to you and thanks, uh, Peter, for the kind introduction. Um, Squirrel Energy, is um, a, if I can go to the next slide, which at the moment it doesn't allow me to do. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so we are a developer, a builder and operator of battery energy storage systems. Um, I'll be honest, we, we are a startup. We, we're fairly young, uh, the company's two years old, but uh, I'll explain uh, a couple of things in this uh, presentation. But, you know, before we go to the solutions, um, I don't know exactly who's in the audience. So some of uh, what I'm telling you, you may have already heard. Um, some may be new, but um, I'm happy to answer questions after the uh, after the presentation. So this story, I think a lot of people know, but what's happening, we are in a transition uh, to renewable energy and um, we are focusing on that carbon reduction. But what that does is it, it means a whole heap of things. So of course we get increased variability in the network and uh, that variability is a variability in, in time. So we, um, uh, we generate energy when, when we don't need it, but it's also, and that's what often not um, considered by people. It's also variability and, and a misalignment, I should say, of supply and demand in, in area. So we may be, uh, generating energy in a location where you know we don't need it but we also haven't got the network to get it to where it is needed and that misalignment of supply and demand in both time and location leads to renewable energy waste so there's a lot of energy that's being curtailed and uh, a lot of people the way they think then uh, of, of how you know to provide a solution to this is to you know build bigger grids, build more grids to get that energy everywhere we need it. But um, that in itself leads to a whole heap of uh, 
of course precious because you know that ha obviously has to be paid for um and those cost challenges will have to be um, you know passed on to customers through network charge and things like that and the other thing what people often underestimate is and i put it here as a last bullet point is rooftop solar so rooftop is you know is an absolute major uh, generator in in our uh, electricity grid and um you know it, it is something like 12 percent of the total energy supply and what's going to happen if that that it is really um earmarked to keep growing and when it grows it will only increase all the variability it will increase that misalignment and um what will happen and that's already um, discussed here and there is that either the value you get from exporting energy into the grid is going to be very low even lower than it is today or you know the uh, the network service providers are just simply going to curtail you and, and stop you from exporting into the grid if they can't handle it so within that within that space if you just look at the opportunities then for batteries and battery storage systems i've given here a bit of an overview so the grid operators, they um, they like this because they uh, there's a lot of discussions going on about building more uh, transmission infrastructure. Now, you know, if you hear the governments in, in Queensland, for example, or other NSPs talk about, oh, we need to build all those overhead lines, you got to understand that those are regulated assets for which they get a fixed return. And um, for them, building it, ironically, they have to do it as cheap as possible, but if it's more expensive, they just get a fixed return on it. So it's very low risk investment and it's all being paid for through network charges. Now, on the other hand, when you are a, uh, an owner of a battery, so battery being a battery energy storage system, what can you do? You can benefit from trading on the intraday cost spread and I'll, I'll uh, touch on that a bit later more, but it's just uh, in simple terms, buying low, selling high. You can reduce your carbon footprint because you can use that battery to store your own renewable energy or buy renewable energy in the market when the renewable energy footprint is really high. And overall, you can calculate that and, and reduce your carbon footprint, which has got a you know, value in itself. You can do peak shaving. Uh, it's a very important thing, peak shaving, because, um, and I'll address that a bit later as well, um, Peak shaving will reduce your network charges, so there's an immediate uh, commercial benefit, but there's also a benefit for the grid because by peak shaving, you can increase the capacity of the grid. And of course, batteries provide you with increased resilience um, with um, uninterrupted power supplies and things like that. So that's what the best owner. And somewhere in the middle, um, you may have heard you know, about grid stability support, people talking about the FCAS or frequency control ancillary services. I've got my view on that, that that market will be um, sort of um, not a very big market and a couple of very big batteries will probably solve that uh, issue. So I'm, I'm not calculating a lot there. Reducing it for grid upgrades, batteries can store the energy so you can delay or you know have less grid ups, uh, upgrades and um, the benefit for all is the, just the reduction of energy waste and the less curtailment. But then focusing on that arbitrage um, really is, you know, this is a uh, an intraday cost spread. This is what the the price actually does in the market um, on the 30 November to 6 December last year. And you can see that there's a number of times where you've got negative prices, and what that would mean is that you would actually get paid to put energy into your battery. And arbitrage really means we buy low and we sell it at the peaks. And uh, that is what at, at Squirrel Energy we're really trying to develop. So what have we done? We've created effectively two products. Um, one product we call a, a best standalone, which is purely a battery uh, connected directly to the network. And we only do the intraday cost spread. So here, um, you know, we... we let's say we 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 rent a little uh, or a long term lease on a on a little corner uh, of of a piece of land preferably close to a substation put a battery on it and trade um that battery but another product we've got uh, is what we call the squirrel embedded product and this is a far more complex uh, project where we you know try to optimize the energy use for the client and um 
I will explain that in the in the subsequent um, slides a bit further. But this is something that really could work in the commercial, the CNI space, commercial and industry, uh, and it also is an application for farmers, as is the standalone, but in different in different ways. And I'm I'm proud to say that we've got a team of um, of, of really good people who can you know provide these solutions and and tailor them to um, to whatever is needed. So to maybe then focus a bit further on the uh, on that embedded product. So when you look at an energy balance, you have to consider where well, on the one hand, you've got a grid supply. And I know a lot of people say, oh, let's let's go stand alone. But I do believe that the grid has got a role to play and it's, it's always a very good backup. It is also a social thing that it, the grid remains, uh, you know, the, the way in which we share energy together and, and in communities. On the other side, of course, you've got your load. And we all know this, which, which can be your farming loads or your house loads and, and anything you use in your business. Then a lot of people got this, which is the on-site generation. And uh, the last bit of the puzzle, which is now coming and, and not known is of course the battery energy storage. So how do you optimize that energy balance and how do you manage that in real time? That's the big question. And that is what uh, with Squirrel Energy, we have effectively created software that um, can do all those things in real time. It can trade in the market because we expose, uh, you know, our clients to the market trading. So we, we can trade in actual price, which, you know, currently with a lot of NSPs, you cannot. And secondly, um, we then try to optimize between the balance between all those um, different um you know, the load and generation and the battery that you've got. So to give you an example of that is, um, let's say when the price is normal, right? what would you do? If you've got a certain load, you first try to use your, uh, your solar. Now, if you still got a bit of solar left after, you know, using all your uh, load, you want to put that in your battery to store it, which is fairly logical. If you haven't got enough solar generation well then because the price is normal you just buy that from the grid but here becomes it becomes a bit tricky because the network charges are always so high you can say well i've got i'm going to put a limit on my grid supply to reduce my network charge and you got to understand network charges can easily be 50 percent of your bill so there's an optimization question there where there's one point where you say it's better for me to actually support my load from my battery and really, the, what we're trying to do is we're trying to optimize that, that network uh, grid supply with uh, the uh, relative energy cost and the cost of your network charges. So that's an optimization question. Now, let's assume that the price is really high. Well, different, you know, a whole different thing. The price is high. So yes, again, you want to use all your um, generation from yourself. but when the price is high, you want to sell your, if you've got anything left over, you want to sell that to the grid and make money because the energy price is high in the market. Um, here's where your limitation comes in is a lot of technical things in relation to that grid connection and when you can import and export and things like that. But you may be better off when the price is high, if you haven't got enough generation yourself to use your battery, but also in parallel to, you know, put as much, um, energy into the grid uh, and sell it and make make money that way. And only as a last resort, when you really haven't got enough battery and haven't got um, enough uh, generation, you know, you potentially can use um, energy from the grid, but alternatively, you can also say, well, we do some uh, load shedding and try to reduce those energy costs. And then the last one, which is people you know, this is an interesting one. When the price is negative, and you can have exposure to negative prices, particularly in the coming sort of 10 years, and that's the way the market operates. Well, what would you do is, first of all, you, you want to take everything from the grid because you effectively get paid to use energy. And secondly, you want to put as much energy in your battery because, again, you get paid to put energy in your battery and store that. The question then becomes, what do you want to do with your solar? Do you want to put it in your battery? Because that solar 
you know, effectively, if, if you want to do the renewable thing and, and have as much renewable energy penetration, then yes, you want to save all the solar. But if you want to purely play on money, you may want to curtail your own solar. And it's a different question. And then I think looking forward, um, I put this little picture in here in the end. Um, I, I think people need to think about, uh, you know, big farm equipment as uh, that's coming. You know, John Deere is coming out with a big electrical tractor in 2025, but effectively it's a battery on wheels. So how do you optimize your battery and wheels at times when you want to sort of maximize that grid connection and maximize and optimize, um, you know, how, how you um, optimize your energy balance really. So um, what are the benefits from doing all this? Um, well, first of all, I think a lot of you may have heard of, about community batteries where you sort of share a network. That's not what we do. It is all individually controlled. And what we're trying to do is to expose you to a retailer who's got market exposure. That means that is possible. There is some retailers doing that and, and we could, you know, we would facilitate that through Skrull and ultimately we could potentially become one of those retailers ourselves. But there is a way to get exposure to that to that market um, to that market pricing. Um, I think for farms, there are different options. You could look at a standalone where you could say, well, hey, I'm going to um, use part of my paddock next to a substation to build a battery there. Um, and then, you know, we can we can support that. You can part own it and make money out of it as a standalone. But you can also then do that optimization if you want for your entire farm uh, opt you know, energy mix optimization. Um, I think the other story there is, uh, you know, particularly a lot of farms there at the end of lines, when we, when we hear about transmission lines being uh, created, it is often, um, you know, big transmission lines from Rockhampton to Brisbane, but the smaller lines to a lot of the farms are not being upgraded or, or in limited way, but still you can increase the capacity of those lines by uh, using batteries, which is, a, I think, a good um, community story. So you use energy locally and you try to release it when it's locally needed, which, as I said before, that increases the capacity of the existing network, creates less renewable energy waste, uh, particularly that curtailment of solar and um, the other thing, very importantly, it can reduce your network charges and your costs uh, by, by doing that peak shaving and reducing your peak demand. And um, I have been involved in, in some discussion on agrivoltaics. Um, I really like that idea because, again, I think agrivoltaics, where you sort of merge energy and, and agriculture in, in one way or another, uh, embeds a lot of the thinking that we uh, that we have in relation to batteries and battery operation. So I suppose that is um, the end of my presentation. So thank you all for listening, and I'm happy uh, to answer any any questions if there are any, or do that later. And then... thanks, Joris. We'll um, do the questions at the end, and we're still waiting on Daniel. He's here, but he just can't get in. Um, so if it's not going to inconvenience Kel too much, we might um, we might go to you. Our next speaker will be Kel Gray from the Pines at Kiama. Now Kel and Marla manage a sixth generation dairy and beef farm spanning 40 hectares situated two hours south of Sydney in Kiama. Operating independently, the Pines their micro producing venture employs regenerative agricultural methods to uphold soil health, animal welfare and effective land management. At the Pines, the dairy crafts farm fresh cheese, yogurt, gelato and milk into, with minimal processing. Their beef cattle play a critical role in their red, regenerative approach, grazing on pastures inaccessible to their dairy stock, thereby contributing to the soil health. In January 2000, 22, they introduced, they integrated a 60 kilowatt solar array with a 60 kilowatt of battery storage to further enhancing their commitment to low impact farming practices. So I hand over to you, Kel. Am I there? Yep, you're there. Excellent. <laughs> G'day everyone. Um, yes, my name's Kel. I'm from the south coast of New South Wales. We're on Darawa land here. 
Um, so I guess to begin with our first interest in, in the solar and batteries was purely idealistic. We like the idea of uh, dairy farming where we can um, make at least amount of impact or if not even make a positive impact on the land around us. Um, and for that, we were looking at renewables. Um, on our farm, we're um, entirely vertically integrated farm with our products. So we turn all of our own milk into cheese and gelato um, here on farm with a little processing plant we've built next to our dairy. Um, that means that we've basically got, um, after the morning's milking, we've got a lot of processing happening, uh, usually up until around lunchtime. And we've got cold storage, including a freezer, walk-in room, a uh, cool room and a um, wa large water-cooled um, condenser that we use to um, mature our cheese to cool the room, the maturation room. So basically we've got 24 hour cold storage every day, all day. So uh, since starting that side of the business, we've had a large increase in our energy consumption and we wanted to uh, look at ways that we could reduce our impact on the environment and that was renewables. As we moved into that space, basically it became obvious that it was also a financial decision. So we sort of started looking at a project where we could get a return on our investment. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work with the DPI, New South Wales, where we did a pilot program where they helped fund uh, some of the project. So for us at the moment, when we first started, uh, we were looking at a return on investment for our system of about nine years. Um, and with the DPI stepping in and the increased in, in um, electricity costs at the moment, that's basically come down to about five years return on investment. Uh, so it is a, that's the solar system that we've got there. You can see it's in a paddock. It's a 60 kilowatt ground mounted system. Um, and with that, it's linked to a 60 kilowatts of flow batteries. And basically at the moment, we're getting um, power all the way through to about five o'clock every morning. And then it's just those hours just before sunlight, we're back to the grid. Um, our solar system faces a little bit to the east. We're not directly facing north. Um, again, most of our production is morning based. So we wanted to pick up the early morning sun, maximize as much power as we could, either going back into the batteries or uh, using, it at, using it straight away for our production. So if we go to the next slide, there we go. So that's the actual batteries there. Um, to be perfectly honest, I can't tell you a lot about them. Um, I'm the farmer that ordered the equipment and very quickly um, was a bit overwhelmed at how much equipment was coming in. Um, my suggestion for those that are looking at doing a battery solar system, if you're on farm and doing it, um, is to have a, for us, the people that installed it weren't local, so they were from Victoria. Um, so I've got a very reliable Sparky that I trust. Um, he loves to problem solve. He loves to be involved in projects. So I actually had him on board while they were installing it. So that uh, many little issues, I now call my local Sparky and, and we can work through it. Um, there haven't been many, to be honest, in the first couple of years. It's really just a bit of loose wiring that might not have been done properly in the first first place. Um, but this battery system sits in a in a shipping container, so it can be moved around if need be, um, but it just makes it nice and contained. Uh, they actually designed it down in Victoria, they built most of it and then dropped it in. Uh, so the whole system itself was built quite quickly. Um, but for 60 kilowatts, um, most of the time by about one o'clock, as I said, we finished our production and then the batteries are almost filled every night. Uh, we've noticing, particularly in summertime, we've, when we're, by the time the sun's going down, uh, those six batteries there are at, at 90, I think 8% capacity by the time the sun's going down, uh, which gets us most of the way through the night. We've also um, been able to move power back to the grid 
when we've got excess. And in the last 12 months, we've signed up uh, to a company called Rethink, where instead of the power going back to our, uh, back to straight back to the grid at a seven cents, um, we now share peer to peer that, that energy um, and an agreed price. So the first place it goes to is a retail shop that my wife and I own selling our own produce in our local town. Um, of course, we managed to negotiate a price of zero cents for that one. And then uh, from there, it actually goes to a friend of mine who is also um, a, a dairy farmer not far from here. And I sell him, uh, uh, I think it's 14 cents a kilowatt is what I'm selling him power at. So double the seven cents, but it's still a good saving for him. And beyond that, I'm selling extra um, energy. If there's any extra, I'm selling it back to the company called Rethink and they've got their own customers. And that's usually, I think, a degree price of 13.9 cents at the moment. So again, in the last 12 months, it looks like that's going to improve return on our investment because we can sell that excess solar uh, at a higher price than what the grid retailers want to pay. Uh, we go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is just a very quick um, look at some of the benefits that we've seen. As I said, it's two years old and we're still learning to work with it. We've had, we've sort of had to be a bit more open-minded on how we operate our business. We have changed some of the times um, that we do make our products. We've actually uh, pushed them back into, into daylight hours a little bit more. So being a dairy farmer, you know, I've, Quite often you're up at four o'clock. If we finished milking early, I'd be straight into the cheese making very early, even before the sun came up. Um, to maximize the use of the solar system, we've pushed that back a little bit. So you, you do go and have breakfast first and then come back into the cheese room and get started for the day. Um, the LPG there is purely for um, boosting of hot water that we use in both the dairy and our factory. Um, we're waiting for an efficient um, hot water system to become available where we can just get our water from 60 to 80 degrees using solar, and then we'll get rid of that one as well. Um, and then this year, we've got a slight change in the products we're making. We're making a little less gelato and a little more cheese, uh, which is much better for our own use too. So we hope to have those energy savings lift. Um, but overall, in the last two years, every build has been at least 70%. Usually the summer ones are closer to 80% reduction in cost, or in price, I should say. So um, it is a very large reduction, and particularly in a, in a business cycle at the moment that we're in, where there's quite a bit of pressure. Uh, my, my advice when looking at these sort of systems, um, I sort of, we, we jumped into it very quickly because we had a chance with the DPI and we sort of just ran with it. Um, if I was looking at these systems, one, one mistake we did make is when we, before we even had the solar is um, for cost benefits, for just being a farmer that doesn't want to spend much money, the cool rooms I bought, the freezer room I bought and some of the other equipment are all single phase. If I had a choice again, I would, pay a little bit more and make them three phase, you get better efficiency out of the batteries. If you can get all batteries feeding three phases an even amount of power at the same time, we've had to go through and um, rewire some ground motors and move them on to different phases being single phase. So we don't overload one phase and one phase is not being used at all. Just something to do in a, um, before you even start is to get a feasibility study done and have a, um, basically some data collected on the use of energy around your farm, when it's being used and how much is being used at that time. Um, and then as for the solar itself, though, the system works really well. Ours, we could probably run sheep or, or um, goats underneath our solar panels, but we can't run the cows, they're just too tall. So we've got to be aware there. Um, that's, so you do lose a little bit of grazing land, but not enough to make a make any sort of impact on our production. But it's been, uh, for us personally, it's an, a really nice system to work with. 
it takes some getting used to. When we had our feasibility study done, um, they looked back and then looked the 12, 24 months previous to installing this system, we'd had a blackout on average every two weeks. Um, previous to that, we had a generator that worked off the PTO of our tractor. So as most of you will know, most blackouts, te blackouts tend to happen just as you're going to bed. And so you'd be back up and hooking up tractors and getting everything uh, set to, on the generator so that you could keep all your products cold overnight. Um, since installing this, uh, the system itself is linked to my phone. I can see where the batteries are at all times and you can judge how much time it um, is left in the battery for me and set my alarm to, to sort of get up just before then and work out whether or not I've got to go onto a generator or whether the grid's back on and we're okay. So I, um, personally, I've had a lot more sleep since this system's been installed, which is again is great for um, work-life balance and great for peace of mind. So I would recommend uh, anyone looking at it, do your homework, uh, do a feasibility study, talk to a lot of people, um, uh, and but overall, they're great systems. And that's it. That's happening. Thanks, Kel. Thanks, Kel. That was a very interesting and practical uh, outline of what you've done. So thank you. Um, we'll keep the questions to later. Um, we'll go to um, Daniel now. Back up here. Now, Daniel, Daniel Bai is a he works for uh, City Power and um, a number of companies, and is a leader and renowned for his strategic focus, his prowess in people development and stakeholder management. With demonstrated record of steering strategic and cultural change, Daniel has proven his ability to lead and manage large cross-functional teams and intricate environments. Daniel's history includes the safe delivery of diverse projects ranging from connections and solar grid connections to public street lighting, customer initiated augmentation projects, premises, premise additions and alterations. His impact is felt across the expansive distribution network of PowerCore, City Power and United Energy covering 1.9 million homes and businesses in the north, southeast, south and western areas of Victoria. So Daniel will talk to us about grid issues. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen um, and uh, whilst we go. But yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk, talk today. Um, I absolutely... Um, yeah, appreciate the um, you guys reaching out to talk uh, all things uh, on farm batteries. So, um, as Peter indicated, I look after uh, the Power Core City Power and United just, Energy Networks. Just, just can I break in, Daniel? Your screen's not sharing. Sure. No. Oh, uh, let me just. Um, just while I'll keep, I'll, I'll keep trying to get that up uh, whilst we go. But yeah, PowerCore City Power and United Energy, we look after, um, as we mentioned, 1.9 million customers in, uh, for those who know Victoria reasonably well, if you drive up the Hume Freeway from, uh, from Melbourne, pretty much all the way west to the South Australian New South Wales border. Uh, we look after that. We look after City Power, which is um, uh, pretty much all of the Melbourne greater CBD. Uh, and then United Energy also um, looks after uh, the Morning, Mornington Peninsula areas. So um, just in terms of uh, large scale, uh, larger commercial size batteries, um, they're still relatively new in terms of um, they're coming on to the network. We've had a really large focus and it's a really big focus from uh, the Victorian state government on residential size batteries. And really over the last three years, we've had a really big push um, from a technology engineering and engineering perspective to see how we can continue to facilitate the growing nature of um, larger scale uh, batteries. For those who uh, keep track, there's uh, quite a large uh, grid scale battery um, just out of Geelong and, um, and uh, just recently over the last three years, we've really moved into um, being able to progress community sized batteries, which is, um, and I'm not sure if we're now, if you guys can actually see my screen any longer. Um, I'll stop no, it's sharing. Still, it's still telling me that you're at now, it's gone. Yeah. 
um, yeah, so we've had a really big focus on um, going into the um, the community size battery. So if you think around the 240 um, kVA mark, we've had a really big push on those um, over the last little while to the point where um, we're also now investigating uh, pole top batteries. So um, actually um, batteries installed on poles to be able to distribute it throughout the um, um, residential areas, particularly down in, in United Energy. Um, and um, just in terms of how we treat um, batteries, uh, and it's very similar right across um, the uh, the broader um, network uh, distribution areas right across the, the the country. Is we treat these as uh, essentially as load because all batteries both can take um, take load and draw it from the network, and they can also um, obviously discharge that that energy back into the grid as well. So we have a uh, a very standard and consistent process to be able to. Um, for people to be able to apply for these types of uh, connections. Um, we have uh, a very, um, over the last sort of two years, a, a really quite solid and um, tech standards that, that also map behind these. Um, and so with the ability to be able to apply for these um, and get relatively quick um, turnarounds now exists, thankfully. Um, I just need to stop sharing my screen apparently. I'll just see if I can do that. Um, I don't that's think screen share has been stopped now, so it's fine. Great. Um, yeah, so we are able to treat uh, these applications um, as load quite quickly. Um, the standard turnaround time when someone does apply for a, to install a battery on their on their property is somewhere in, in the order of twenty to forty business days. Um, and um, the one uh, piece of advice that we do give to our customers um, is. Uh, how they wire that battery up is actually quite important um, because when there are network outages and I'm sure many of you have solar, when the network actually goes down, um, that, that solar system will actually stop generating power. And so there's no different with a, um, with a battery. Uh, if it's connected to your property, you may not be able to draw from that, bat uh, that battery unless it's wired um, in a very particular way. So we do ask that um, people to have a look at that. Um, the other thing that we are starting to explore at the moment is uh, standalone power systems. That's been um, that's a really big uh, uh, consideration at the moment for a lot of our customers is how they can um, not necessarily have a reliance on the grid. So um, uh, whilst that doesn't necessarily bode well for us as a uh, as a network provider, that is something that our customers are starting to ask uh, for in terms of optionality moving forward. Um, just in terms of if people do have sort of large, um, large, uh, large farms and they're being able to distribute that power sort of um, as the, um, the previous gentleman sort of showed in terms of being able to sell his um, power to his neighbours. Um, but right now, the service installation rules don't allow for um, power being generated in one farm to actually being electrically connected into another farm. But what you are able to do is, is share that power essentially virtually for no better of a term. So there are these, this concept of a virtual power plant where you are able to sell your power essentially to yourself um, as the other guys that um, are. And, and that could also be to your, your neighbours but it's all done virtually rather than being electrically connected um, as uh, I think uh, Cal was sort of indicating before, um, which is actually um, you sign up to a uh, electrical retailer to be able to provide that, that service for you. Um, it's not a service that we provide. It's, um, that's outside of our regulated uh, obligations. So we actually can't provide that, that, um, that service for you. Um, but there are options in terms of being able to distribute that power um, either uh, through uh, from one farm to, to another um, that may not, they might be several uh, kilometres away. They might be hundreds of kilometres away. Um, that's all done via what they call a virtual power plant. Um, and uh, I'm happy to share with more information on that if that's uh, of a particular interest uh, to the guys uh, that are here today. Um, and there's, uh, when we are uh, sizing these batteries, it's really important to consider, uh, it's the same as the solar system, is um, how much generation and that you would need to, to operate. A lot of these things, um, particularly on a, the smaller commercial side, is people need to consider uh, and not over-engineering um, those um, and making sure that, um, yeah, we, we, we size the systems to, uh, to cater for what um, site. Um, unless you are uh, opting to um, 
uh, to sell to your, to your friends uh, and you know family members or neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, that's all I, uh, just in terms of um, how to apply for these, we have an online um, application uh, portal. It's called My Supply. Um, in Power Core and City Power and My Energy in uh, United Energy. So um, uh, it's very simple as um, uh, registering to, to that, those portals, um, uploading your specific information around the battery size, any technical documents. Um, we do charge uh, essentially an application fee uh, that's somewhere around um, the $2,000 mark. Um, and if that um, if that project proceeds um, and that 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 essentially a deposit is taken off the cost of any augmentation work that we may need to do because uh, for particularly large batteries and solar systems in order to be able to export back into the grid there could be um, network augmentation that needs to be factored into um, and whether that's transformer upgrades whether that's uh, um, you know, line reconductoring, um, it, it really does depend on the individual uh, battery uh, that's out there. Um, so just something to consider when um, looking to go down this path. Um, that's all I really wanted to run through this afternoon. Um, so if, I'm happy to answer any particular questions that people might have around technical constraints on the network, uh, implications, um, anything you like. Thanks, Daniel. Um, all right, well, we'll um, slip right into the questions. Um, now, I have one here for Joris from uh, Mr. Bruce Curry in Queensland. Our business is seeking information on how small renewable electricity producers can get greater involvement in providing electricity to the grid. One highlighted aspect of the solar electricity production was the opportunity for everyday people to be involved in the production and benefit from the diversified income stream. For rural property electricity users located along a transmission line, on long transmission, transmission lines, unless they can play a bigger role in the renewable energy production sector, it is difficult to see how the grid can be economically maintained. So maybe, Joris, you lead on, and Daniel might have a view as well. All right, well, thanks for that question. Yeah, so when you look at the, at the, forefront of, of bigger batteries and bigger battery systems where we are looking at is that um, like uh, uh, the gentleman before Daniel mentioned that you know you, you may need grid augmentation depending on how you um, treat those batteries. My view with batteries and that's discussions we've had with Energex and, and, uh, and Ergon as well is that the new battery tariffs when you look at connecting to a grid, they can be linked to windows, certain windows. So any any grid um, or uh, and, and and power line really has got certain windows in which they really would like to use your um, your energy. And there's other times when you you cannot draw energy, and the the network charges will start to reflect that, and that is coming. If it's not already there, there was a trial tariff in in Queensland where that was happening. But the nature of batteries is, by definition, if you follow the market, they're sort of counter to, you know, to the need of the grid. So they, they will always become a load when you, when you need a load on the grid, and they become a generator when you need a generator on the grid. And if you combine that with um, peak shaving, you can actually increase the, um, the, ex the existing capacity of the existing grid and maximize that rather than doing augmentations. But you need some software and some safeguards that you cannot export into the grid when it's not uh, required and, and not use it. And then sort of to, uh, listening to your entire question, um, you know, for individuals, they can become involved on a small scale, um, particularly if, if you sort of start to get exposed to the market. So. There is uh, network service providers out there that expose you to the market, but the, the risk of that is you still need the software to make sure that you make the right decisions at the right time. But th that is the software that we have developed and the, the battery control systems. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Do you have a uh, something to add, Daniel, or move on to the next question? Yeah, I, was, I, um, I, I would, I'll just echo all of that in saying that, um, yeah, there's absolutely tariffs that um, are being developed at the moment um, to be able to um, 
make it easier uh, and more economical for people to sort of play in this market. Um, but as it stands at the moment, um, they are only trial tariffs. Um, and in 26 to 31, which is our neg re next regular true period for us at City Power, Power Core and UE, um, we will absolutely have new tariffs that would uh, enable that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, on the basis of more practical things, I've got a question for Kel. Uh, and you don't have to answer this. One person would like to know what the capital cost of your system was. Uh, that's pretty easy, either you, you'll answer it or you won't. And the second one is uh, what changes, if there were any, did you have to make or new practices did you have to incorporate to cope with the new landscape? And how long did it take to integrate into the daily business? And what personal reflections or challenges uh, did you go through to the point of welcoming the new farming landscape? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll answer it. 220K is what we, we paid, uh, for the system. Um, and I think since then there's been a price reduction in some of the equipment, especially the batteries. Uh, so it might be a bit cheaper these days. I don't know. You have to find that one out from Redflow or from whatever organization you use. Um, and so the second half. What was the second question? Oh, the second question was more about um, personal reflections and challenges that you went through in bringing the new system into your farming landscape business. Um, I think because you've got a working a working electrical system on your farm, suddenly it's another piece of equipment. It's something else that can go wrong. Um, you've got to you've got to be aware of it. So um, I, I'm not a Sparky, so my I do have to bring my Sparky on board. Um, to go through the system when it was being installed and you do you can get things little little hiccups go wrong um as we're getting used to the system like i said some of our motors are single phase we overloaded some phases and so um, you'd be in the middle of production and suddenly um you've got an overload problem when you had an overload problem everything shuts down so you're standing in the dark in the middle of your processing room wondering what's going on um those little hiccups can be frustrating, uh, I guess, because when you get power from a grid, you don't have to think about it. It's not your equipment. It's not your issue. You just ring up and say, I've got a power out, put it back on. Um, when it's in-house, uh, suddenly it becomes your problem a little more. Those are, those are some of the hiccups we had, particularly probably in the first six months as we're just working out our system and our production. Um, our feasibility study, very much focused on simple data, you know, how much power we used per day, um, what size batteries, how many, um, was it going to be worth it in terms of, um, as I said, having power 24 hours a day uh, available to us and not having to do, put up with blackouts. What we noticed was we have to be a little more uh, sensitive to what power we're using when, um, or, so that our production schedule now reflects the sun a bit more, to be honest. As I said, we start a little bit later in the day. Uh, we are moving, our system's changing even now. We're going to move into once day milking um, for us. It's just a, it's a personal choice that's going to work for our business. You know, when we look at our holistic management system, it's just going to work. But we're probably going to move that milking from the morning to about two in the afternoon. So we will use um that power in the afternoon which at the moment is going into the batteries or into the grid or as i said we're selling in that virtual peer-to-peer -peer program um but to be honest the best use we can do is to use the power we generate on farm ourselves and so we're going to move our milking to two o'clock in the afternoon then we'll hold the milk and then we'll kick off as soon as the sun comes up hits the panels the next morning that's when we kick off our production just for we think that's going to be the most efficient way to use the system that we have. So I, I would say the reflections are you do just have to be a little bit flexible. You have to understand that you're in-house now. It's not just part of a broader system that you can deflect all those problems onto someone else. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Daniel. Um, are there many commercial and residential customers on SWER, whatever that is, you might explain what that is, is PowerCore investigating taking these customers off grid with, with PowerCore and solar battery genset assets? 
Uh, thanks for the question, Ian. So um, we have about 30% uh, of our um, PowerCore customers are on a SWIR system. And for those who don't know, uh, SWIR stands for Single Wire Earth Return. Um, and it's very, very prominent in the, uh, the rural areas of distribution um, networks. Uh, and largely because it's a rather cheap uh, and economical way of um, providing power. So there's only one, um, uh, one conductor in the air rather than two or three. Um, and in terms of us taking some off grid, uh, there are certain um, customers that yes, we will, we will look to do that. And that's largely got to do with um, maintenance costs on those, uh, on those spurs. Uh, and to be honest, uh, there is probably an equal amount of SWIR customers that we'll look to do that with as um, single uh, multi-phase customers, single or multi-phase customers. Um, if you think um, like there's uh, like telecommunication towers at the top of um, say the Yu Yangs, for example, um, the amount of vegetation clearing and maintenance on that on those um, lines is is quite significant, uh, and it's also quite a lot of outages as well. So um, yes, we will be looking um, over the next sort of two or three years around um, uh, yeah removing some of those and actually having standalone power systems at those sites. It's also an offering that we will be required to give um, uh, our customers in the next really reset period from 26 to 31. Um, so we're developing systems and processes around that um, also in case there are customers out there who do want to be completely independent of, of the grid in terms of um, um, pole and wires but still want to have a networked owned um, generation and supply very good um question for joris uh what are the emerging battery technologies that might replace um lithium-based batteries and are there any government grants for these batteries or off-grid pv systems it's a good it's a good question it's a very broad question um Firstly, at, at the moment, if, from our perspective, we're looking for proven battery technology that, you know, that is proven and, um, you know, best value for money. But when we're talking about at the moment, you've got lithium, um, you know, phosphate, lithium um, and phosphate battery. They are being used in cars, so they've got a high density. Uh, and when you apply batteries to farms, you don't don't necessarily need high density batteries. You can have lower density batteries. Um, I'm not sure whether everybody's aware with the C rating of batteries, but it effectively a C rating stands for the speed by which they can charge and discharge. And so there's different batteries for different uses. Um, one battery technology that I'm aware of that is coming up is uh, lithium titanate oxide, which has got um, is a very, very fast battery uh, they're more expensive, but they last, you know, 22,000 cycles as opposed to 8,000 cycles for a um, normal uh, lithium ferrophosphate. Um, but again, it, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. So I think flow batteries can be really good. There's, again, different types of flow batteries. There are some flow batteries that you can increase in size for a relatively low cost by just increasing the uh, the amount of fluid you use. Whereas others, like I think Redflow uses cells that are independent and uh, you have to connect them all together. That's what I'm sort of aware of. All right. Um, an interesting question for Kel, and, and I won't use the company name, but it comes from Will. Uh, and so we can be just a little careful about not um, denigrating companies, but uh, Will's wondering, if you had any thoughts on how the customer experience could be improved with dealing with these companies? Um, we, our cust customer service we've had has been fantastic, to be honest. Um, probably getting the right information in the beginning could be more helpful. Uh, sometimes I think technicians forget that they're talking to people who aren't trained in their field. Um, so I'm happy to teach them how to milk a cow, but don't ask me how the battery works um, and I'm not that interested in learning it so um, sometimes you don't want the data just the sales pitch you want some reason reasoning behind it um, and uh, to be perfectly honest I've, in the beginning I would have liked a little bit more information on the after sales care what's involved what's coming up what to look for if there's things going wrong 
Um, but for us, we use a company called like, our batteries are Red Flow. They're monitoring them 24 seven. Um, and there's been a couple of times where I've come out of the dairy and their cars in the driveway and they've said, oh, we've noticed a little issue with one of the batteries. We're going to go and replace it. And they have. Um, so for us, we've had great customer service so far. I really can't complain. Very good. Uh, we're nearly at, at one o'clock, so but I've got a couple of other questions. One person is uh, from Peter Stray is asking, what is required to set up a solar battery power charger system for charging two vehicles overnight in Southern Victoria? And do you know the current costs? Um, maybe Daniel or maybe Joris might have a view on that. Yeah, I think um, uh, the pro process wise, um, again, you'd if you just apply via uh, my supply, and I'm happy to share the link uh, in, in the chat here, um, the application of that's uh, very, very simple. Um, cost is very, very difficult to talk about um, as Joris has sort of indicated um, to everyone. Every single site is very, very different. Um, I, I can't comment on the actual um, cost of the systems, um, but uh, traditionally when you've got, say something like the EVs, that's, um, and it's going to be connected to the network. Uh, again, we all consider that as load. So we just really need to be quite um, careful about how we um, talk about costs because one site might be $10,000, another site might be $250,000 uh, and can be anywhere in between. So um, I, I probably can't talk about costs, but I'm happy to share how to apply um, in the chat just here. All right. Um... And we have another question here, which would be probably helpful for a lot of people from Michael Gooden. Where do you go to find out what is the amount of power you can put back in the grid from your solar farm project? So where would you suggest you start? Um, how much solar can go back into the grid? So um, yeah. if you're uh, less than if your system is less than 200 kilowatts, um, you can apply at uh, Power Core City Power United Energy um, and you'll get an automated response with uh, how much power you can export back into the grid within about two minutes. Um, if you're greater than 200 kilowatts, um, it goes through a manual process. Our automated process is based on real-time uh, voltage assessments. Um, but um, yeah, again, um, if you go head to powercore.com.au or unitedenergy.com.au, um, and follow the links to um, my supply or my energy, um, you'll be able to apply for those there uh, and you'll get an outcome uh, for less than 200 KVA systems in two minutes. Well, sounds excellent. Um, I have one last question and I'm only asking it because it's always in the news, but why do lithium batteries blow up and is it as big a problem as the media would like to make it out? Whoever would like to ask, answer that one, probably Joris. Yeah, look, the, the, um, the, the, there, there is an inherent problem. If you look at a bigger utility scale batteries um, that come in a container, they often got um, fire um, suppression systems in them. And they've got also an automated link to the uh, you know, fire brigade so that they can come out. The problem is, is when they catch fire, it is very, very hard to put it out, if not impossible. And, and you've all probably seen the little movies where they just let, let a battery run out. So I think when you look at the different types, it is really where do you put them? How do you use them? If you are very, very sensitive to fire, you, you may want to use another technology. So the red flow batteries, for example, they're, they've got a very low or, or, or negligible fire risk. Um, but yes, it's something that, that you've got to take as an assessment when you look at your overall project. All right, well, that might bring us to the end of the webinar. And I'd like to thank Doris, Kel and Daniel for a very interesting talk. And um, hopefully the attendees have got some information out of it. Um, if anybody wants more information, I can pass on their uh, details. Uh, so contact me through peter at farmersforclimateaction.org.au and I'll endeavour to get contact details to you. But um, thanks, everybody, for attending and thank you. Thanks for organising. Thanks, Peter.